thank you very much to um, the PHG team for putting on the event today and for, for inviting me. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And it must feel like, I don't know whether it's a wedding or a birthday or something, but it feels like that being part of it as well, because it, it's a really fun day to be part of. Um, I didn't see the delegate list in full before I came. And it's been a real treat in each of the breaks, bump, bumping into people and, and having great conversations. Um, what I wanted to do over the next 15 minutes is share some of the perspectives from us, Genomics England, and, and from myself, to be honest, about the, the experience of being part of um, this really exciting genomics ecosystem in, in an extraordinary era, um, and to reflect particularly on the role that PHG and other organisations like it have had in being part of that big picture. Um, this is um, our vision as Genomics England, but I think it's probably a vision that a lot of people in this room buy into, which is a world where everyone um, benefits from genomic healthcare. Um, and I think it is, you know, it's a team sport. Um, we, none of us in this room individually or organizations could be doing this alone, and that's what makes it so fun. It is also, you know, if I think back to um, where, um, we were 25 years ago, where people, what people could have imagined being the case today, no one would have got close. Also, even the last five years, the, the continuous waves of innovation that are coming towards us are just extraordinary, and we're only going to be able to capture those benefits in the right way, um, working together and, and thinking about all of the different aspects of those the, the questions that we need to explore together, whether they're at the sort of the hard science um, end of the spectrum. What does this technology do? How sensitive is it to detect this signal um, through, you know, the, the, st the statistics um, and the sort of the, the clinical implementation science, which is so important, um, all the way through to the questions around what people want us to do with this technology, what they want to know um, to direct their own health care and their own well-being. Um, and so many of those different questions need quite different approaches, but they have to be all connected, and that's why it's so nice to be part of this ecosystem. And it is those, those waves I talk about, I think um, they can feel overwhelming at times, I think. And I think particularly whether one's um, a clinician, I'm, I'm a clinician um, occasionally still, I, once a month I sit in clinic, and it can feel overwhelming. You have to keep up with the day-to-day. -day. You have your existing practice. You first want to do no harm, um, and yet you can see all of this potential, but you're scared by it because you don't know whether actually, on balance, some of these uh, interventions will create, whether it's harm in individuals or to the system as a whole, by bringing in change too fast. And I think there can be the real temptation to just sit there and do nothing. And that is quite safe. It's, it feels quite comfortable, to be honest, most of the time, if you're not in the midst of, you know, for example, for yourself or someone close to you having cancer or being diagnosed with a rare condition which you know might benefit. Um, and it takes, I think, bravery sometimes to think about how we navigate these questions and how sometimes it's right to do things that feel not natural or to change to say things like June said earlier today, which is perhaps, you know, there's a place where there is no, uh, it's right to have no regulation, but also being clear about where we're uncomfortable, where not having enough knowledge about the really important things that we're all rightly worried about, like risk, um, like the balance of benefits in those different ways you might measure them. Um, so I'm going to briefly share some of the, uh, just a, a, um, a few areas where over the years through 100,000 Genomes Project, I can see sort of elements of this balance and this partnership working being really important and thinking about how we have learnt during that that last, the last 10 years that we've been part of this ecosystem. Um, thinking about how, over the, the coming years, we can work better and ask these questions in a more sort of foresightful way, because it can, it, you only learn through, through doing and through that experience, and we've learned a lot um, along the way, and I certainly feel I have. Um, so you can see, this is just one slide with perhaps a one set of what is a much a broader, much broader ecosystem than just the organisations that happen to, to feature there, but um, um, it's really central to, to our working in the, the everyday for Genomics England because of our focus on the use of genomics 
in the healthcare context is our partnership with the NHS. And I think one of the things that makes it most exciting to be part of this ecosystem um, is not just um, the fact that, you know, that we have so many different players, that we've got these waves of potential technology and knowledge coming our way, um, but it's also in the UK, we are uniquely placed to take advantage of this. We're not the biggest country in the world, um, but we do have a single um, healthcare system that provides uniformity and the potential to ask questions that in the US, they're so jealous of us being able to ask, um, to, to think about generating evidence about <laughs> novel um, therapies, for example, more individualized therapies, that people in the US, companies in the US, know they can't ask there. Um, and it's also a real potential to think in that long term. And I think today we've heard talks where the focus has been particularly and rightly on understanding early on about how technologies are working or understanding how one manages early access where that's the, there's that uncertainty. I think one of the things that's really important to acknowledge um, is that uncertainty carries on and on and on and you have to um, build a system that continues to learn because um, once, particularly with these increasingly stratified interventions that we can conceive of. Um, the knowledge that we have at the point where we think it's right to give something a go, whether that's in a pilot or whether it's commissioned um, or whether it's in another setting, um, we know that you'll continue to learn. You'll know that some of those decisions will be wrong or slightly um, set up in, in, in the wrong way. And we have to set up systems that can continue to teach us so that services can be ceased if they're not making um, the impact that we're expecting or that they can be improved. And that, that linkage, not just through studies up front, whether they're clinical trials, whether they're, um, um, whether they're, um, they're other sort of formal um, research studies, um, but making that link um, on an ongoing basis between healthcare and research is important across medicine, particularly as it becomes more and more stratified, but I think genomics is um, it's absolutely central to us, to us making the most of what we can um, in genomics for the future. So I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about the, um, some of the, the elements of evidence generation that came from the 100,000 Genomes Project, which has helped us think about what our role, Genomics England, should be in the midst of this um, as we move into sort of the, as we've moved into the next phase in supporting NHS England in the delivery of whole genome sequencing in clinical care. Um, and as we think about some of our um, new research initiatives. So um, when we um, were first established, we were set up to, to deliver the, the 100,000 Genomes Project, which focused predominantly on two areas, on diagnostic use of whole genome sequencing in rare disease and the use um, of whole genome sequencing to help um, diagnose, stratify, and the plan care for patients um, with cancer. And we recruited... Um, about 35,000 families with rare disease, more than 70,000 individuals from those families, and 17,000 plus cancer participants. Um, and that was, as Sue told us earlier, was a model that helped us understand how you might implement whole genome sequencing in, in clinical care. Um, um, it also formed the, um, the beginning of what we now refer to as the National Genomic Research Library. Um, so a growing, um, cohort of people who've um, consented to their data being made available in a way that we've learned through engagement and through the practice of the 100,000 Genomes Project people are comfortable with. It comes with downsides. The model is one where researchers visit the data in a trust, so-called trusted research environment setting. It comes with big downsides for the researchers, but it comes with a big upside that it is something that people are broadly comfortable with in um, an NHS setting, and it's one that people are uh, increasingly adopting and, and crucially access to the data is controlled by an independent access review committee and the terms and the, the sorts of research that can be carried out are very clearly set out in, in um, the research protocol and, and the materials that people are signing up to. Um, part of those materials and probably the most crucial bit is that ability to link back into clinical care to be able to recontact people for example um, if I'm sat in clinic with a family with a rare condition who joined the 100,000 Genomes Project or who now had a whole genome test through the routine service and said yes to the research offers, more than 90% of people who are, are asked now say, um, 
I can say, well, if I'm contacted in the future as a result of a research finding that's relevant to you, I will tell you. Um, and and we, we do do that. And as, um, as Sue said in the last um, year, we've had more than a thousand such findings return into care. So sort of routine um, sort of care improved through the research, but also generating evidence um, to help drive policy um, and to help inform decisions about a sort of performance of individual interventions. Um, linked to that is the consent allows pulling in of data um, about longitudinal um, sort of health status of, of various sorts, which me means that, that that resource becomes quite valuable. So for example, in, in rare disease, um, when we looked back through the 100,000 Genomes Project, we could see which conditions diagnostic rates were highest in. Um, so we could understand perhaps where value particularly lay in terms of diagnostic use of whole genome sequencing. We could understand things about the overall performance of testing, which um, overall identified uh, uh, between 20 and 25 percent of um, rare disease um, participants. Had, we, we could find a diagnosis. We could see where whole genome sequencing was adding particular value over other types of testing, because in, in some settings, a high diagnostic yield might be achieve just as well to another technology. We need to see where that, where that value is particularly added. Um, and we can also see um, the, the um, healthcare experience of those participants, see how many appointments they had in the system to help drive understanding, for example, of the health economics, and again, understand where the particular value lies. In cancer, similarly, um, using that data um, it can help, help drive individual care for, for patients. So this being a, a, someone who was recruited who had a cancer of unknown primary, it helped us to identify it was most likely a lung primary uh, um, uh, metastasized to the brain, looking at different elements of the whole genome data. Um, but stepping back, we could also um, see, for example, the ability to identify people who individually might benefit from a particular clinical trial, or here, and this is data that's um, in preparation for um, a paper um, that will probably be published shortly, um, we can see where the um, reported variants sit as compared to the, the sorts of um, gene targets that used to be routinely looked for um, in um, cancer genomic testing. And this, again, is, is data that, can, that has supported NHS England's policy decisions on targets for whether it's whole genome or panel testing. So again, sort of driving um, policy um, and um, system decision making. Here, an example, this is um, longitudinal outcome data on patients where we here were looking at the effectiveness of a particular algorithm for detecting a particular type of um, DNA repair defect in and that's common in uh, patients with ovarian cancer and, and breast cancer. Um, and they're patients who are, more, uh, who are eligible for PARP inhibitors. Um, they also have differences in outcomes, and you can sp begin to both see those outcomes played out in front of you. Um, you can also um, use, use the data to judge the effectiveness of this particular algorithm. So um, that link between clinical care and research really key in driving some of that, I guess, some of the more scientific elements of the decision making, but lots of this is actually not just about the science. We all know that, and I think particularly today, being here um, with um, uh, with the PhD Foundation is is very clearly the case. And I think a lot of what we learned through the process of delivering the 100,000 Genomes Project with NHS England and and thinking about how. Um, what additional conversations we needed to have in the public with experts about how genomic healthcare should be delivered in the future was just as crucial. And that's that whole thing of, of genomics really being a team sport. And that's something that I really enjoy about our role in, in the ecosystem and some of the, the, the future-facing um, initiatives that we're um, thinking about at the moment. I think that's, you know, it's, it's more, even more crucial. Um, so I'm just very briefly going to touch on um, those uh, on three of the initiatives, just to give you a flavour of how that thinking is, is feeding in, and I think ho hopefully helping us to do a, a better job of establishing those programmes and developing that evidence and, and, a, and a path to sort of future um, um, evidence on those. So, and, and in each one, I'm going to sort of characterise the mode, I guess, we're thinking in, um, in terms of, of, of the role we're playing. So the cancer programme that... Um, is, is led by uh, Matt Brown, our chief scientist in, in the audience, um, is looking in two areas. The so first is, is asking the question, 
is um, long renal and methylation sequencing useful in cancer um, um, somatic testing? Um, it's, it's a question very much at the sort of scientific clinical implementation end of the spectrum. We need to know about where it adds value. The sorts of question that I was talking through in, um, in the cancer program, also about the practicalities of situating machines closer to patients here, sat um, in um, distributed um, uh, rather than centralized, thinking about the practicalities of, of, of that. So implementation science, plus some hard, hardcore bioinformatics, and, and, but definitely at the sort of sciency end of the spectrum. Again, our multimodal data um, program here is us really at the research end of the spectrum. Here the question is, will sitting um, image data from histopathology slides and from um, scans alongside genomic data and that clinical data add value um, to un the understanding of cancer biology? Um, so very much at the sort of the, the research end of the spectrum, and who knows where that will take us in, the, in time to come into sort of implementation and so forth. Um, our diverse data program here, and, and Gil spoke about um, some of the, the questions specifically around PRS, but really acknowledging the, the importance of engaging on diversity, not just with regards to ethnicity, but more broadly um, when we're talking about genomics, acknowledging that we need to make our data sets better. But actually a lot of this program is about engagement with communities, our understanding what is most important with, to communities in terms of how they um, wish to participate and drive decisions about research. It's also um, about and the sort of the geeky end of the spectrum about building better tools that can help you use data um, to the maximum. Um, but really that here sort of thinking very much flexing that sort of engagement muscle, but not in isolation, linking that to the work that is done in practice. And then finally, and uh, after this I'll stop, don't worry, um, our newborn genomes um, program, which is um, asking a sort of, I guess, a really big generational question here. So the big question is whether, and if so, how, um, should all babies be offered whole genome sequencing at birth? That's a big, knotty question. There's all sorts of different elements to it. There are all sorts of different reasons why that might be a good idea, but also reasons why it might be something you want to pause and think about. And um, one element of that is thinking about the, acknowledging the very different potential areas of, of use. So firstly, in screening, which is the area where we think if there's a case for this now, that's the primarily the driver. But there's also the ability to support research um, and to learn more about screening, about diagnostics, um, and also the potential to, to, um, it, uh, to store genomic data for ongoing use during a lifetime. And in each of those different elements of the program, there are different strands. And really, the aim of the program is to get that really broad look at the data that policymakers need to have at their fingertips to make decisions on this. Um, and by doing that, by in designing the program, it's really been an experience of pulling together and working with all of the different elements of the genomic ecosystem, forming really strong governance with the NHS so they can help us decide what conditions to return findings on and tell us if there's capacity in the system or not. Um, but also engaging with the public, um, with experts, for example, the PhD have um, developed a report for us on um, the regulatory um, and legal aspects around lifetime genome data storage. So it's a really um, sort of a mixture of that, those different strands of evidence you need to bring together to answer these really big questions. So I hope I've given you a sort of a, a whistle-stop tour of the, the our thinking, where we are, and also the, sort of our, our experience of you know, really being in the, in the melting pot of an exciting ecosystem here. And I think the, sort of the biggest thing for me is that acknowledgement that this is a lifetime endeavor for even after um, there are decisions made on any implementation of any given um, test or um, intervention, acknowledging that we need to continue to learn. And I think particularly in the, the area of individualized therapies, that is so much the case. And we really need to sort of acknowledge that and in some cases move quite a long way in terms of how we think about generating evidence and, and evaluating it. So thank you. Thank you.